Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining. My name is Mark Tyrell. It's the uh, 3.30 session on the last day of Pi Data Global. Uh, I have uh, with me here uh, Timmy Lolua, and thank you for the um, pronunciation uh, display in, in your name. It's very helpful, because otherwise I might be a bit lost there. Uh, so uh, Timmy Lolua will be uh, talking to us today about uh, data quality. So why don't you go ahead and um, you can introduce yourself because I'm sure you'll do a better job than I would. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for um, having me and letting me talk. Yeah, so I'm gonna share my screen with you guys. Yeah, so today I'd just like to talk about uh, so much data, such poor quality. I think this is a really important topic to cover uh, because I, I feel like as the world is developing a increase uh, increasingly uh, keener interest in AI and big data and how people are really excited about it. I think that we have uh, lost track of making sure that we have data quality measures in place to uh, keep track with this interest. So uh, here's over what I'll be talking about, a little, about, little bit about me, how data is rapidly changing and growing at a crazy rate and how this, um, this is having an impact on data quality and also some data quality tools you can use for um, yourself or for your, uh, your institution uh, so that we can all uh, grow as a community um, in improving data quality. So <laughs> here's a little bit uh, about my background. So I'm a data engineer and biomedical engineer. I have been um, doing uh, the area of this, uh, work in this area for about a little bit over 10 years now. Uh, so I've been, I've done a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I've done like cancer research and bio um, additive research and uh, lots of cool stuff in academic research, consulting for a lot of big companies, um, entrepreneurship, including having a biotech startup focused on diagnosing um, pneumonia um, in pediatric um, cases. And it's been a really cool experience. Um, but I think from all of, all of these experiences, it really has made me more passionate about having quality data so that you can't have those business insights that you want and you can't have those, those healthcare insights that you want. Oh, and also I'm a Project of Tech grad. I love Georgia Tech. <laughs> data is increasing at a rapid rate. So according to the IDC Loba Data Sphere, by 2025, it's expected that we'll have 175 data bytes of data. That's a lot. So if you could wrap um, DVDs on top of each other around the world, uh, this would be equivalent to wrapping around the world 221 times. If you are downloading this data at like an average internet speed, it would take you more than 2.18 billion years to download all this data. It's a lot of data. And like I said earlier, people are super excited about it, but what about the quality of the data that we're making every day? Is it really giving us what we need so that we can have those insights that we want? But what happens when the, uh, this data goes wrong, right? When you have poor quality data, it impacts businesses and institutions in real ways. So according to the MIT uh, Sloan Management Review in 2017 report, they say that um, 15 to 25% of revenue can be lost due to poor quality data. <laughs> That's a lot, right? And so we, we just look at the health industry alone in the US, not the whole world, just the US. We're talking about an industry that's more than $10 trillion, right? So just in that industry alone, we're talking about more than $2 trillion lost every year due to poor quality data. That's a crap load of money being lost <laughs> every year. When you think about all the industries that are put together, when you put together healthcare and, and banking and business to business um, institutions and Education, it's a lot of money being lost every year around the world. But it's more than money. Like I think people think about money because it's something that we can measure and it's something that we can clearly see. But we're also talking about the bigger impact than money. You're having an increased risk exposure um, for various industries, decreased regulatory compliance. And also, I would say most importantly, maybe even more important than those two, is having improperly informed decisions with severe outcomes when we're talking about some high stake industries. But uh, to me, um, from my perspective, some of the high stake industries where we really have to be vigilant about data quality, 
is definitely um, healthcare, logistics, and the financial sector. And I, I know I chose these um, three because these are the ones that I have experience with. And I just want to, uh, please let me know if I'm speaking too quickly uh, or anything. I guess you're going to just slow down. <laughs> Sounds good so, for my side. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, something I think that we all have thought about over the past almost like what, two years now of dealing with COVID-19 uh, is how logistics like was a nightmare, right? So I think we think about our personal experiences of like going to the grocery store and not being able to get toilet paper or your favorite snacks and you know how inconvenient that was. And I think for uh, Fortunately, uh, for most people probably um, who had a chance to come to the conference, it was probably just an inconvenience, right? But there were people who were severely impacted by uh, data quality issues to me on COVID-19 and like food waste and food insecurity. Um, and it shouldn't have happened, right? So one of the biggest challenges of logistics um, that happened with COVID-19 was food waste and insecurity. So in one part of our ecosystem, we have our, our, our food ecosystem and supply chain. We had people who were literally food insecure, people who had lost their jobs, people who had been laid off, who were now having to go to soup kitchens and, and seeking out help from places that people who had never done this before. These are people who were, you know, previous to COVID-19 were economically stable families, right? But then on the other end of the supply chain, we literally had farmers have, who were being forced to dump milk and to plow over produce because there was a bottleneck of oversupply. Now you think to yourself, how is that possible to have an oversupply at one end and then literally people being food insecure and families going hungry some night at the other end? It's a logistics problem and a poor, poor data quality issue to me. In addition to some, some other just you know, business problems, right? So these farmers are being forced to um, dump millions of gallons of milk, you know, every, um, every day because they didn't have anywhere to send it. These farmers were used to dealing with, you know, large customers like restaurants and schools that are now closed because of COVID-19. And because, you know, milk is a perishable item, um, perishable item eggs, produce, you can't keep that for long term. But there's no way in the system to, to, for, to me, timeliness of the data was really key in, this, in being able to connect the, the, two, the two areas, right? The area of need and the area of like oversupply. When you don't have the time, like the timely data, you don't have accurate data, you don't have um, a robust logistic system with that quality data in place, you have issues like this that happen. And these things already existed, right? And they still exist. COVID-19 has exposed these issues in a way that we probably had never, you know, seen before. And again, there are obviously there's some business issues there. And how do you retool something that, you know, machines that were, you know, supposed to be making products for, you know, large scale consumers to individual consumers? Obviously that, that will have to be addressed too, but it also is just a lack of data. Like how do you, because you don't, if you don't have the timely data, you don't have the accurate data, to connect these um, two parties, <laughs> then you have um, the, the big impact of like the food insecurity at the same time of having um, overproduction by these farmers. It blows my mind. And I think um, at the center of that, it's definitely a data quality problem. But this is just one example to me of data quality issues um, that are just to get used more attention in the world right now. Finance is a big data quality issue um, problem that we have to continue to be visual about because of the big impact of it. So just like our uh, one great example is that in October 2020, it was like just like a little bit less than, um, a little bit more than a year ago, Citibank was fined more than $400 million by U.S. regulators because of several long-sitting deficiencies in its data governance and data um, risk management practices. What does that mean? in everyday terms. This means they have like poor quality checkpoints in place to make sure that the data is what's supposed to be. They didn't have uh, testing protocols in place that were consistent to be able to verify and validate that uh, funds were in certain places when they really weren't um, or somewhere else. In one um, instance of the reasons why the regulators cited 
and find Citibanks because they had sent more than $900 million to the wrong um, customer, one of their creditors. And then uh, this is just one example, but they had actually sent large sums of money to wrong customers. And some of the customers um, didn't agree to send the money back. But <laughs> but then what do you do uh, when this bank is FDIC insured? It's supposed to be compliant with all the regulations in place, but they're not in terms of their robust security protocols in place that the money is going to the correct um, customers, that your um, the money is being um, checked, that you have the verification and validation procedures in place uh, to make sure that this, this data about your, your customers is secure, not just like large corporations and large creditors, but also everyday customers. If their data is not secure, when you go to go to the local bank to get a loan for your first home and they deny you based off of poor data, who's there to, to check them? You know, I think that they were properly cited uh, for um, consistently having issues over years. This is just one issue that they have been fined for, but this is just one bank. So think about the, the high risk uh, and rewards that happen when you have either good financial data or poor financial data, how it impacts everyday people and how it impacts big industry and how it impacts the stock market and overall in our economy. It's like too important for us to not have quality data and quality verification validation procedures in place to make sure the data is what it's supposed to be. But to me, like, okay, we've, we've talked about food insecurity, we've talked about logistics and we've talked about finances, but above all, and because like healthcare is in my heart, I would say that healthcare is the biggest um, opportunity for us to be vigilant about data quality because we're literally talking about life and death situations. ECRI in one survey, of about almost like 200 hospitals, estimated there were about 7,600 wrong patient events over a 32 month period. This led to, in 9% of these cases, patients either being harmed or even death. <laughs> That's ridiculous, right? So uh, a lot of the issues that ECR, ECRI found were like mismatched records, um, patients in, um, who had similar names are being confused. Um, gaps in the, the patient data. And you would think, okay, this is, this is probably not very common. It's actually very common. You think about um, like how patients will go from maybe one doctor to another, like someone moves from one city to another and how gaps in the patient's records can exist or how there's poor integration between um, hospitals, even the same city. Like they don't have any contingency plans for integrating that data together and validating it. Or if you know someone has a common last name like Johnson or Smith, you know maybe having extra verification and validation procedures in place to make sure that this patient is who is sitting in front of this this doctor, like it's it's crazy, but it has life and, and death outcomes. We're talking about diagnoses, um, also the huge cost to insurance. Uh, there was another study that said that more than a third of insurance claims that were denied were because of mismatched patient records. That's how common it is, right? And so this is happening more, <laughs> a lot more common than people um, think it is. And we're talking about uh, the difference between someone getting life-saving treatment potentially and not getting that. So if this is happening in just a small sample of hospitals, suited hospitals, think about how common this is across hospitals all across the US and in the world. And I'll say another reason why this happens very often is because of legacy systems, right? So hospitals usually do not, um, their technology does not change at the same pace as other business um, sectors because of the, it's a higher regulatory environment. And then when you're talking about combining maybe even paper records with electronic records and they're not being a system in place, again, verification and validation procedures, that makes it really challenging for clinicians, because clinicians really shouldn't be responsible for this. I think that it, there needs to be a better partnership with technologists, with you know people who work in quality control, the data analysts, data scientists, data engineers, um, so that we can fix this issue because it, it's, a, it's bad for the clinicians who want to give their patients great care, and it's bad for the patients who want to receive great care and want to leave the hospital with less issues than when they went to the hospital. So it's a big problem. I definitely would say, um, 
this this challenge that happened with ECRI and their survey happened because of poor checkpoints again for validating data in the integration of systems. And I think that uh, through these these three examples of data quality challenges, it's important to talk about you know what things should you be looking out for when you're trying to improve your data quality and you're trying to manage it. These are just some of the core elements to me that are important to having good data quality. That will be completeness, making sure that your records are complete from like when they, when they should start and when they should end, traceability of the records. Are you able to see as the data is navigating through your ecosystem, the lineage of that data, who uh, initiated or you know, created the data? Who, who are the internal customers for that data? Who are the external customers for that data? How often is, it, is that data being used? Is it being changed? How are you tracking that in your system and in your overall data governance plan? What are your validation and verification um, plans for this data? How are you able to look for anomalies and, and drift and for error? And then what is your acceptable range of error? Like there are a lot of companies that don't have verification and validation plans in place and don't have a predetermined um, error point because you need to be able to have that predetermined um, point of acceptable error in place so that you can say, okay, hey, if this goes beyond this you know, 5% error that we think is um, agreeable for, for this particular data point, but we need to, we need to uh, raise the red flag. We need to send the alarms off and say, hey, we need to go look and see why this error is happening to data and see if we can fix it at the source level. Then also, um, how many unique data records are there? Um, are you able to distinguish between you know, one record and the next? Is, and then also, is it consistent? And timeliness. I'll say timeliness is one of the biggest challenges for most companies, right? So for most data scientists and data analysts, they spend the majority of their time wrangling the data and make, trying to get into the proper format so they can actually be usable for the company. And that, to me, is very inefficient. It's a poor use of human capital. Um, or your, you know, your staff that you have available, then it's something that could definitely be reduced. It's not going to be mitigated completely, but if you can make sure there's a baseline quality of data at the ingestion points and checkpoints throughout your system, you can save so much efficiency for your companies. And then also, I just want to get into some data quality tools. So I talked about, and I may have to switch the screens. I think I just, you know, pressed the Adobe, but um, to show you the links. Uh, there's Azure Purview. Azure Purview is a pretty new, a new tool to Microsoft. Uh, it's about less than two years old, so still kind of nascent, but it does have some good features in it to manage data quality. Um, looking at the lineage of the data, um, having different drivers available to connect to you know, Azure, like the Azure ecosystem for Microsoft within um, there. Having a data dictionary and be able to see what terms are uh, in the data and being able to track the data uh, but it's still pretty new. And then you also have Calibra. Calibra is a, a great tool. Calibra is, uh, I should say, Azure is through subscriptions. You have to pay for that. Calibra is a, a great tool that's also for pay through subscription. Usually you're going to see like large educational institutions or, um, you know, just like large companies use it because it's kind of costly. And it's going to depend on like the cost. The cost can depend on the features that you want on this system. But it has a great... Um, data quality feature, including um, LDQ. LDQ was acquired by Calibra in the past several years. It, it has like some machine learning features, look for a drift, anomaly detection of the data. It has a data catalog, kind of similar to like um, your experience if you were shopping for data sets like on Am like Amazon, you're shopping for something, you can have data sets shopping inside of your organization. It's pretty cool. And you have prophecy, Prophecy is also pretty similar to Libra. Uh, it can connect to a lot of external drivers. Then you, but to me, I think the biggest opportunities are for open, open source tools, right? Because a lot of times through the development that happens through open source tools, it creates better for pay and open source tools that come from that. Apache Griffin, Apache Atlas are two Apache tools that are really great together for your data quality and for your overall data governance. Apache Griffin, can ingest the data sets and see changes in it over time. Um, it doesn't have as many features as some of the for paid tools, but it's a great initial tool to begin your data quality journey. And it's for free. So you can um, make adjustments to it or add additional features that you'd like. 
And Apache Atlas is a great tool for managing your data dictionary, um, managing your business dictionary, adding some security features to, um, to your existing data infrastructure. And Admin is, is also a great tool. I wanna see, we have a little bit of time. I wanna go to um, Apache Atlas and Griffin and show you how it looks. I'm gonna X out of this, and then I'm gonna go to my other screen. Let's see. So I'm gonna go to screen share and we'll go to screen two. And then should be able to see this. And so then when I click on Apache Griffin, it's like, wow. Okay. So can you see this, uh, Apache Griffin? Yeah, we can see it now. Okay. <laughs> so you can see it's like getting started. It allows you to define your data quality metrics. Um, it allows you to have a scheduler. It looks for these particular measures for data quality, the accuracy, completeness, timeliness, uniqueness, validity, consistency. Like I said, the core elements of data quality. And this was a, initially developed as an open source product from eBay. It's really great. And there's a um, nice little like user interface that allows you to easily manage it. So even if you have like some non technical people on your team, as long as it's like initial, the API is, you know, set up with your system by your engineers, not technical people can easily use it too. I'm gonna to show you some other ones too. So Apache Atlas also is a really great tool, for, not just for data quality, but for data governance overall. A little bit slow, Let's see. Maybe it's not connecting. It might be their website. That's okay. Let me show you the other ones. I want to show you a four pay option too. Uh, there are some advantages to going ahead and paying the additional cost for using a bigger company. So Calibra to me is one for like, as far as the four pay products go, is one of the best products on the market for data quality because they have a complete solution for data governance. So um, you can uh, have data quality, uh, data governance, um, plan completely managed in the platform, um, usable for business users and for technical users, your data lineage, your data quality, but definitely for like LDQ, it's, it's uh, really, really like a leader for, for Calibra. Let's see, here we go. I won't get to the other products. I wanna like have a few minutes for questions. But one of the th things I really like about Calibra is the machine learning feature. So for the a lot of the other data quality tools, you have to individually go in and define what you want those rules to be. Like, which, what's my error range going to be? What's the, how do I define an anomaly within my data set? With um, Calibra, they allow a wide range of data sources to be ingested um, with their JBDC driver. So it can be from AWS, it could be from Azure, it could be from... Postgres, uh, my, my SQL database, it really doesn't matter. Like any database you can think of is on here. It's freaking amazing. Like, <laughs> I'm biased because I, I, I've used this tool um, significantly for customers and I really like it, um, but it's great. I mean, you can look for auto discover, um, rules, anomaly detection, data reconciliation, sensitivity. Um, so maybe um, if you know someone on your team didn't initially recognize the data was sensitive, recognizes it. I mean, it's a lot of great options out there for pay and for free. And um, I just, I, I, I hope that people become like more aware of it, the importance and the impact of data quality issues and um, that there are tools and there's a community of people who are excited about this and who want to improve it. I want to give the last few minutes for q and If anybody has any questions, I'd love to answer them. And thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you, uh, Timina Lua. Uh, that was really uh, exciting. I, I love your enthusiasm, uh, especially for the Calibra. Um, in particular, yeah, the, the finance and healthcare examples, shocking stuff. Uh, so the Q&A is open. Uh, please go ahead and ask your questions there or in the chat. I have a question for you. So, so you came from like a technical background, but then you got into data governance. <laughs> yeah, okay, so I, my little pivot or whatever happened, I would say in grad school. Um, so um, I went to um, grad school at Richard Tech and I was in the medical device development program. So that's like 
not just like developing like the devices themselves, but learning about uh, risk com- risk control and risk mitigation and developing validation verification testing, because that's like a very, very big um, like focus for the FDA. Like mo- the, the thing they care most about is like being able to consistently reproduce the same product. Like does it do what it's gonna do all the time? And um, that may be interesting in public policy. So then I got linked up with the public policy department <laughs> at Georgia Tech. And they may be really interested in quality. Like how does quality connect to data? How does it connect to healthcare? And I think that it's something that just is really overlooked because of like how important quality is for healthcare. I feel like people in technology don't think about those verification and validation plans and quality is just like, oh, it works. I didn't get any bugs this time, but you need both. And so I like the fact that I'm like, like at the intersection of both, like I have a chance to make technology, but then also bring that like public policy healthcare side into it and say like, hey, is this reproducible? Can we verify it? Can we validate it? And then what tools and tests we have in place to make sure that that's happening? Yeah, I think that really adds a lot of value. Uh, Question from Jorge, how much config does each tool need? For example, for sensible information, I guess Calibra is tuned for the US market. Uh, not much other countries where things like social security number doesn't exist. I'm sure it's adaptable, no? Oh, it's definitely adaptable. Mm-hmm. Um, so it can, so it's going to like the configurability that's required is going to vary for each tool. I'll definitely say for the open source tool, you're going to have to do some more legwork because they are open source. So they're not as user friendly. They don't have like a large staff, like making it as user friendly, like for, um, <laughs> for Griffin, if you like, let's say that your company is using um, a you know, cloud computing environment, you're going to have to set up a virtual machine, then you're going to have to set up the API and then connect to your system. But once you get through that step, it is user friendly after that. For the other tools that are for pay, they're definitely more user friendly because there are more people working on it. So like for Prophecy and for Calibra, it's made for your business user as well as for your technical user. And so you can literally, um, you're going to need some help connecting the, the JBDC drivers. So those are the drivers that connect to external sources of data. But after that, like your regular, regular team members, your, your secretary, your business manager, they can go in and use um, tools like Calibra and Prophecy like very easily because they're made for the, like having the business user and the technical user in mind. And you said, you know, is it for just the U.S. or abroad? Um, for most of these systems, they can recognize like different sensitive informations across countries. Because I know like in the U.S., like an example of sensitive information would be like a credit card number or your social security number. Whatever that equivalent is, they can usually recognize that because they have customers all over the around, uh, all around the world. I would say that's one strength that Azure has because Microsoft has so many customers around the world, like almost in every freaking country there is, they easily recognize like national numbers or different countries, like ideas of sensitive information. Um, But then you can always, like I said, no matter if it's open source or if it's for paid, you can change that and configure it to, uh, you know, what your needs are. Cool. Okay, great stuff. We're actually out of time. Uh, There's a few more questions in the chat. Please feel free to take those up on Slack uh, with Timilalua. So thank you again very much. Appreciate it.